Welcome to EPG Patashala. My name is Dugirala Vasanta. I am on the teaching faculty of the Department of Linguistics at Usmana University, Hyderabad. Uh, today's lecture deals with uh, course 10 um, with Psycho Neurolinguistics, module 22, uh, the neurolinguistic part of it, and the title is Aphasia. The objective of uh, main objective of this lecture is to describe major causes uh, and classifications of aphasia and also to point out uh, that language breakdown associated with stroke aphasias uh, is very um, you know uh, different in different languages it's language specific the nature of breakdown is language specific so to um, emphasize this point i will share a little bit of data from hindi aphasia um, Aphasia has been defined as an acquired language disorder following brain injury causing reduction in language content, language form and language use. Okay. It can also affect some of the cognitive processes like memory and attention which definitely underlie language. The diagnosis of aphasia is based on uh, neuroimaging techniques uh, which correlate the site of lesion with diminished performance in language, uh, language tests, the administered series of language tests, the performance is correlated with uh, the location of the lesion in the brain, which is determined using neuroimaging techniques, uh, which I have uh, dealt with in another module. So, what causes aphasia? Um, as I said, that in this module, I will only be focusing on stroke aphasias. So, stroke aphasia results when there is a um, stoppage or diminished blood supply to areas which are supposedly involved in language production and comprehension all right in the uh, according to classical model most language areas are located in the left hemisphere so suppose the left hemisphere language areas do not receive sufficient blood supply um, or there is a hemorrhage or there is a, you know embolism. I will explain these uh, concepts in a minute. So, middle cerebral artery um, supplies most of the important language areas in the left hemisphere. So, if middle cerebral artery is affected, uh, then you get stroke aphasia. So, a majority of the people who are diagnosed to have stroke aphasia has some problem related to middle cerebral artery, all right. Uh, so, let us look at various causes of stroke aphasias in more detail. Uh, look at the figure shown on the screen, uh, it is called causes of aphasia. You see the leftmost figure is about thrombosis or thrombotic stroke. Uh, cerebral thrombosis uh, results when the blood vessel is narrowed becomes narrow because there is a clot. A blood clot, clot goes and lodges itself in a blood vessel and because of the narrowing, sufficient blood does not go into it um, and it can cause uh, stroke aphasia. The, the narrowing of the blood vessel can also happen due to de plaque deposits, all right. Uh, they, they can also narrow the blood vessel. The, other than thrombosis, the second major cause is embolism. It is referred to as embolic stroke, the middle figure. An embolus is a blood clot um, or other kind of debris which is circulating in the blood uh, which travels. It can form in the leg, uh, but it can be carried into the brain uh, through the blood circulation and then it can get lodged in the middle cerebral artery, uh, uh, impeding the flow of the blood to the language uh, serving uh, areas of the brain and that can cause stroke aphasia. The third major cause for stroke aphasia is hemorrhage, okay, thrombosis, embolism and hemorrhage. Hemorrhage as the picture shows, the rightmost picture shows is a burst blood vessel. Uh, if uh, for various reasons uh, internal hemorrhage takes place, a burst blood vessel leaks the blood out. So, sufficient blood does not reach the region which is subserving a specific language function and then you have stroke. Um, 
So, with uh, this kind of idea, I mean this uh, noticing that these are the major causes of stroke aphasias, the initial uh, understanding about aphasias is the classification of aphasias is lesion based. In other words, uh, the classical model which held that most of the important language areas are located in the left hemisphere. So, let us look at the picture on the screen which is showing the important language areas in the left hemisphere. So, you have the primary auditory cortex and the vernicase area in the temporal lobe. Look at the figure and the arrows are pointing out to primary auditory cortex and vernicase area in the uh, superior temporal lobe and you have Broca's area in the third frontal gyrus, the pink colored area on the, in the, uh, you know, pointing out as Broca's area. Then you have uh, Wernicke's area is connected to the Broca's area through a band of fibers called arcuate fasciculus. Then you have angular gyrus, which is involved in reading and writing. Your primary visual cortex, so much of the information you, you see from the environment, you see that goes into the visual cortex, uh, travels via parietal lobe, angular gyrus into Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area passes it on to, after interpreting the meaning, it passes it on to Broca's area through the arcuate fasciculus. Broca's area it gives instructions to the corresponding uh, uh, muscles involved in speech production. So, uh, Broca's area sends instruction to the uh, motor cortex to the area which is which corresponds to lip and jaw and palate and all this um, musculature speech musculature which is involved in speech production and we open our mouth and start speaking and so this is the classical model uh, which has influenced classification of aphasias uh, into uh, you know uh, broca's aphasia vernicke's aphasia and if the arcuate fasciculate fasciculate fasciculus is uh, impaired, it is called conduction aphasia. So, when you classify aphasias like that, it is called lesion based classification. The second type of classification is impairment based classification. Uh, so, you can say non-fluent aphasia, which is uh, expressive aphasia, which is same as Broca's aphasia. When Broca's area is damaged, because Broca's area is supposedly uh, responsible for speech production, the patient has problems speaking fluently, alright. The patient will be non-fluent. So, Broca's aphasia is also referred to as non-fluent aphasia. The other terms for this is motor aphasia, expressive aphasia and there are also two other aphasias clubbed under non-fluent aphasia, transcortical motor aphasia and global aphasia, okay. So, all these different types of aphasias, the common thing is all of them have disfluent speech. The speech is not at all fluent. As opposed to these non-fluent aphasias, you have fluent aphasia. They are Wernicke's aphasia, transcortical sensory aphasia, conduction aphasia. Here, the patients who are diagnosed with Wernicke's or conduction or transcortical sensory aphasia, uh, these uh, patients speak fluently but it makes no sense. They, their problem is with comprehending other people's speech. Their own speech will be fluent. Okay. So, um, basically the classical model has guided all this. But more recently, um, the aphasiologists have come up with flow charts to guide classification. Uh, see the picture on the screen. Uh, uh, the, on the brain, the left hemisphere, um, the blue side is all the comprehension side and the red colored side is all the production side uh, very roughly and so you have aphasia and if uh, you ask a question is the aphasia uh, can it be treated as a uh, fluent aphasia if no um, uh, you come to the uh, uh, left side branch if your answer is yes uh, you go to the right side branch ok. So, if it is non-fluent aphasia, then is the comprehension affected? Next question is comprehension affected or not, alright. In uh, non-fluent aphasia, comprehension is not affected. So, you see another no, N standing for no. Then, does the patient have problem in repeating? No. 
in uh, broca's aphasia non trained aphasia there is no problem in repetition so again another no all right so you look carefully at this flow chart uh, which has guided classification of aphasia uh, into fluent and non fluent and beyond fluent and non fluent in relation to comprehension repetition like that so uh, i will not go into every branch but i uh, urge you to uh, study the flow chart uh, carefully to understand how this flow chart has guided uh, uh, the classification of aphasia now um, the uh, lesion what we mean by lesion uh, in three different aphasia the next picture on the screen will explain to you see broca's aphasia look at the lesion site uh, it is uh, Uh, corresponding to broca's area okay third frontal convolution uh, there is a big red uh, mark there saying that this is the area damaged in broca's area and the problem is production all right um, wernicke's aphasia is the superior temporal lobe the red uh, mark on the brain uh, showing on the superior temporal lobe if when that area is damaged you have wernicke's aphasia and the main problem is comprehension okay and they use a lot of new words neologisms and things like that we will go into details of patient's uh, speech later on but here i am talking about broca's aphasia lesion is in the third frontal convolution wernicke's aphasia lesion is in the superior temporal lobe and if the problem is uh, with repetition and conduction aphasia conduction aphasia the lesion is Uh, in the fiber tract which connects wernicke's wernicke's area to broca's area that is the um, uh, the you can see the lesion involving um, uh, the uh, arcuate fasciculus and here uh, repetition is affected okay error filled speech but comprehension is not affected in conduction aphasia okay so this is about the damage what is the damage in these three major types of aphasia Uh, of course the screen the figure on the screen next uh, tells you about various different aphasia types you have let me just read it out broca's wernicke's conduction which i have already explained to you transcortical sensory transcortical motor global aphemia pure word deafness okay so um, the one of the earliest um, attempts to model aphasia was uh, is shown here it called uh, uh, let's time uh, model uh, you know geschwind geschwind and let's time together they offer this model of uh, motor aphasia affects production and uh, uh, the wernicke's aphasia affects comprehension so when the comprehension they have shown in here for the production they have, they are pointing out lips in the diagram there all right uh, but let's look more closely at what happens when you are diagnosed with broca's aphasia the speech of broca's aphasia uh, has a telegraphic quality because uh, um, it affects um, small words the grammatical morphemes not the contained words that way it's called telegraphic speech uh, as you know that when we send a telegram we don't write the full sentence with a and d those are the words we omit we put the content words so the broca specific speaks as if uh, you know it's uh, only the content words are present out but please remember this definition of broca specifica telegraphic speech applies to english language all right very soon i will say that we cannot generalize this description to languages which are very different from english for right now you just remember that broca specifica results in non fluent speech where content words are preserved but small grammatical morphemes uh, like a and d are lost all right in broca's aphasia comprehension is relatively intact one is not saying 100% intact but relatively intact therefore the patients not only understand um, your speech if you are speaking to them but they also know that they are not speaking well so they get upset so broca's aphasic get more upset about their own condition they show frustration and sometimes they refuse to speak um, and of course uh, left hemisphere is involved so they get paralysis on the right side 
right hemiparesis. It's either total paralysis or weakness on the opposite side. Left hemisphere is involved, so right side hemiparesis or hemiplegia uh, happens um, because of the crossover of the fibers. Remember, we talked in the earlier module, 80% of the uh, fibers cross over at the level of medulla. Okay. Now, um, persons with Broca's aphasia also have difficulty reading. Uh, they cannot easily uh, retrieve uh, appropriate words to use in conversation. All right. Okay, now let us move to Wernicke's aphasia. In Wernicke's aphasia, uh, the main problem is with comprehension, not production, right? Their speech is fluent. They tend to have what was called at one point lagoria. In other words, speak in long sentences and lots of speech, you know. Uh, so, that are frequently unnecessary. You ask them something, they go on speaking which is not uh, related to the question you asked, alright. Uh, they even make up um, things and just keep on talking. They have a great dif difficulty, great deal of difficulty understanding other people's speech. There is reduction in reading, so it, uh, Anika Sabesha also may be connected to dyslexia and in some cases even dysgraphia. You will learn about this from uh, the other module about dyslexia and dysgraphia. So, let us now compare Broca's aphasia with Wernicke's aphasia by focusing on the salient points. All right? Broca's aphasia is non-fluent, Wernicke's aphasia is fluent. Okay? Broca's aphasia is characterized by good comprehension, Wernicke's aphasia impaired comprehension. Broca's aphasia is also referred to as expressive aphasia because the problem with expression, Wernicke's aphasia is uh, referred to as receptive aphasia because the problem is with understanding. Broca's aphasia is also referred to as motor aphasia whereas Wernicke's aphasia is uh, referred to as sensory aphasia. Broca's aphasia results in what is known as agrammatism, meaning uh, impairment to grammar. Wernicke's aphasia results in paragrammatism. Uh, with uh, new words, uh, they are not words in our language, they are called neologisms or they create new words. All right? So, these are some major uh, characteristic features which distinguish Broca's from Wernicke's aphasia. What about conduction aphasia? Because the lesion is located in the fibers which connect Wernicke's area to Broca's area, remember that arcuate fasciculus. The lesion is located in the arcuate fascia. So, these patients main problem is they cannot repeat anything, whatever. You ask them to say, say after me uh, and you say a word, they can't repeat. You say a sentence, they can't repeat. Uh, phrase, they can't repeat. Whatever you ask them to repeat, they fail to repeat. Alright. But their own speech is fluent. Their own speech is fluent. Um, there may be some self-corrections. Uh, they are able to uh, understand spoken language, but uh, they do have some difficulty retrieving appropriate words in conversation. Reading and writing uh, is variable, you know, depending upon the lesion, it varies. There is a condition called anomia. Usually, it, is, it comes with posterior lesions, that is lesions in the temporal lobe, not in the frontal lobe. Anomia, uh, patients diagnosed with anomia experience considerable difficulty in naming day-to-day -day objects, everyday objects. You show them uh, what is this pointing to a chair, they cannot name. You show them a pen, you show them a pencil, you show them a spoon, everyday objects, no object they can come up with the name, but they know what it is meant for because they engage in what is known as circumlocution. If you show a um, pen, they, will, they might even imitate saying that, it is used for writing or whatever, but they cannot use the word pen. So, they will uh, point to their head if you show a comb, but they cannot say comb. So, they know what the object, what the word is and what what it refers to, but they, they do not get the word. Okay, So, these are called circumlocution. And then because they cannot get it, they go around the bush. That is what is called circumlocution. They go around describing what it is meant to be used. So, in uh, anomia, Comprehension is preserved somewhat, uh, even repetition, they do not have major problem with repetition, reading and writing. 
they tend to use lots of pauses because they're not able to get the word they use lots of pauses um and but still their uh, speech is relatively fluent because it's only a problem with naming objects all right now uh, whatever uh, different types of aphasias i have described so far in this lecture uh, i would like to say they are mainly based on english language that way they are anglo centric right uh, in the e text you will find samples of uh, aphasias experienced by english speaking patients i don't want to repeat that here you go back to the e text look at broca's aphasics um, english sample how it is why it is called telegraphic speech you will understand if you look at the sample similarly i have given english sample of wernicke's aphasic of conduction aphasic many samples i have given there okay but i would like to come back to our context the indian context marked by multilingualism uh, it's not just multi- bilingualism and multilingualism all of us are biscriptal multiscriptal we we write many languages we speak many languages so what happens to aphasia in the context of india involving patients who know and use more than two languages that is what i would like to uh, engage with a little bit uh, so if you see on the screen next i given you a sample of paraphasias in hindi speaking aphasics which a neurologist has uh, uh, was kind enough to share with me uh, the phonemic paraphasias in hindi for instance i will just give i will read out only one example from the samples that i have given you spend some time looking at it later on so the patient will say kattak for kartik kartik masam ma you know month month of kartik when you when you ask them to say kartik they the person said kattak so it's a phonemic paraphasia at the level of phonemic phonemes the mistake is at that level at that level what about semantic paraphasia will be something like this when asked to say um um something like uh, chaku the patient said sabji so it's a semantic level you cut a vegetable with a chaku he is asked to say chaku and the patient is saying sabji ko sabji se something like that this particular patient is saying sabji se for chaku all right um formal verbal paraphrases um the patient i believe said sir limba sir lamba for sri lanka all right um i don't know we'll need to think about what exactly happened to the patient neologism is tarona for ladka now there is absolutely no phonemic level or semantic level relationship it's a new word what is tarona nobody knows so i don't know that it's a neologism new word created by the patient there are other examples i suggest you read you look at them carefully later on but what is the explanation for phonemic paraphasia uh, i am giving another example uh, shared by the same neurologist uh, poor operonic uh, from indore has given me some of this uh, data from his patients jugnu for firefly was pronoun- uh, pronounced as gunju gunju there is a reversal of phoneme uh, semantic paraphrasia the patient observed sabji se for chaku i have already read that out earlier here the intended word and the error belong to the same semantic field you know uh, vegetables and knives with which you cut vegetables at some level there is some relationship associative relationship between vegetables and knife and therefore there is some confusion and one was substituted for the other formal verbal paraphrases like this sir lamba for sri lanka neologisms like par parki for kursi we have no uh, explanation as to why they come about although uh, researchers have uh, made use of linguistic constructs like sonority uh, the perceived loudness whether neologisms can be explained uh, in relation to Uh, whether they follow sonority principles or not 
uh, again uh, there is uh, some of the reading uh, material I have suggested in the e-text will give you this information. That is, there are articles which deal with um, uh, sonority explanations for the kind of neologisms observed in aphasic patients. I will not go into details right now. But uh, again, Pauranik uh, published a study in 1996-97 uh, in Usmania papers in linguistics which I have edited and I have quoted it in the e-text. Uh, in this study, Pauranik shared data based on 40 different aphasic patients who came to his clinic. Broca's aphasic, uh, he noticed, uh, exhibited more phonemic paraphasias. Wernicke's aphasic uh, exhibited more of anomia, alright, and more semantic paraphasia. Okay, so there is a need to examine the errors. Uh, such errors, for, he he also know, said that there is a need to ex, uh, examine further, deeper into. Uh, what is behind this kind of errors? Can sonority explain uh, these errors? Do phonotactic rules of Hindi explain these errors? Recall your other uh, courses in linguistics, phonotactic rules are language specific. Which consonant can follow which other consonant? So, it is at that level more research has to happen in the Indian context. You take data from Hindi or Telugu or Kannada, and you apply these linguistic constructs like sonority and phonotactic rules and see if we can explain these errors using those constructs. Let us now look at how agrammatism ag uh, manifests in relation to English. Um, see, uh, an English patient was asked to describe uh, uh, a picture in which one girl is giving flowers to a woman. The patient, all that the patient could say is, the young, the girl, the little girl is the flower, the girl is flower, the woman, the girl going to flowers, the girl giving, giving, teacher, giving, teacher. This is how the patient is speaking. This is what we mean by agrammatism. Look, look, none of, any of the sentences, there is no grammar. Okay, this is an example of how agrammatism manifests in English. What about agrammatism in Hindi? Let us look at the sample on the screen next. I will only, I am not a Hindi speaker and I may not be able to read very clearly, so I will only read one sentence. Or lark wood cut hai. To say, and he is cutting the wood. Uh, here, notice, lark wood. Wood is English. Lark obviously is Hindi. Uh, so, this patient is suddenly, both words came to the mind. Uh, lark wood cut rah. It is not even raha, rah, he, okay. So, that is how it manages. I have given more sentences and I do not want to repeat. You please read and uh, try to reflect on the nature of agrammatism in Hindi. Um, but let me comment because I have taken this comment from uh, Bhatnagar who also is another neurolinguist. He shared his data with me. Uh, uh, in fact, the data that I am asking you to read is from Bhatnagar, uh, Subhash Bhatnagar. Um, he uh, noticed that uh, there are auxiliary deletions, but the principal verb uh, that needs uh, that needed no agreement marking was provided correctly. If a verb did not need to be uh, need, need to agree with other components in the sentence, the verb was pr um, produced correctly. The difficulty in verb phrases was confined mostly to inability to use appropriate verbal inflection. The patient reportedly used erroneous conjugation and infinitable constructions without inflection. So, again as I said, you need to examine the data very closely to understand this point uh, which mark agrammatism in Hindi. Um, there is one more uh, data, uh, Prasanna 2008 reported some more data uh, based on Hindi uh, agrammatism. Uh, the examiner said, uh, say he is bathing in Hindi, O oh, na, uh, na raha hai. The patient said, O oh, na rahega. So it means he will not stay, right? Totally, completely uh, different. The patient used future tense marker that was Im improperly affixed on the aspect marker. There was deletion of auxiliary and malformed verb. Conversion to past tense could not be accomplished by deletion. 
see the way Hindi is breaking down in acrimatism, okay, which is specific to Hindi language. The um, what I show on the screen next is example of paralexia in Hindi English bilingual anomic atresia. Okay, once again these mistakes that occurred in this this patient, please remember, is an educated patient, but uh, because of the stroke, they she she or he, I don't remember, made lots of mistakes. You examine the mistakes carefully. Uh, I yeah, I think I have some information. So, 42 year old female uh, stroke patient. Master's level education and the mistakes they made is SOLT for salt, uh, SUTKES uh, for suitcase, like that. You look at the uh, mistakes the patient made, you know how it should be spelled, and you see how it is breaking down uh, in aphasia. To summarize this lecture, I have given you a definition of aphasia, I discussed major um, causes of aphasia. Um, uh, especially with a focus on thrombosis, embolism and hemorrhage. Then I talked about classification systems and then I presented some data from English as well as Hindi samples to demonstrate how anomia and agrammatism uh, uh, manifest in these patients in English as well as in Hindi. Very briefly I described uh, but for more details uh, I request you to go back and consult the e-text and read the uh, reading suggested in the e-text. Thank you.